it's certainly my honor to be here uh, at the University of Hawaii and to be here tonight. This is just an amazing, impressive panel that Liam has pulled together, so thank you so much. Uh, I hope to learn a lot tonight about the Public Land Development Corporation and also just to keep the timing moving. So each of our guests is going to have from 10 to 12 minutes to just talk to you about uh, their involvement in the PLDC. And then I'd like to give them a little bit of time to talk uh, and ask questions of each other. And my hope is to have at least 15 minutes for audience members to ask questions at the end. Uh, so with that in mind, the first thing that I'd like to do is to read just a couple of paragraphs for those of you who are not familiar what, with what the Public Land Development Corporation is. And I'm just reading this from their website. Uh, so I'll read that to you to set the scene, uh, and here it is. The Public Land Development Corporation is a state entity created by the legislature in 2011 to develop state lands and generate revenues for the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Through public-private partnerships, the corporation aims to attract private companies as joint partners in development opportunities. The corporation was formed after the legislature passed Bill uh, 1555, which was signed into law as Act 55 by Governor Neil Abercrombie. The corporation is governed by a five-member board of directors. Three state agencies are represented on the board, um, either by the director or their designee. The agencies, the three agencies, include the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, the Department of Budget and Finance, the Department of Land and Natural Resources. And then, so that's three of the five. And then one of the members is to be appointed by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and one member is appointed by the President of the Senate. Now my understanding, and I'll let the panelists uh, go into much more detail on this, is that there's been quite a bit of public opposition uh, to this uh, legislation. And that uh, discloses, I'm not an attorney. Actually, this part-time law program is something that I'm actually kind of aspiring to as a potential option in the next couple of years here. So <laughs> it's fantastic to be able to get some, uh, some insight into what actually goes on. Um, and with that, I guess that should tell you something also about a lot of the folks who actually write our laws um, and answer a lot of questions about some of the, perhaps, in drafting uh, uh, faux pas that find their way into statute every now and then. Um, we're not all attorneys, uh, but we do have public's interest um, at heart, and, and it's the culmination of everything that we do together that gets drafted by um, other attorneys into law. Uh, which ends up, of course, as HRS. Um, you know, this issue really goes back um, far beyond, or far, far prior to 2011, and it starts out with a, a number of things that I'll just get into. You know, for a long time, there's been, particularly following 2007 with the economic downturn, questions about how we sustain our economy, and in particular, the construction sector at that point had taken a pretty significant hit, um, and one of the things that we had seen in the succeeding or in the, the preceding years were a number of bills um, trying to boost construction, trying to, trying to streamline permitting processes and uh, things like that. And that really led up to the Public Land Development Corporation bill and the debate that surrounded it. The other part of the discussion which um, uh, came about as a result of the Public Land Development Corporation, or I should say created it, was the question of um, revenue for the state. How do we maximize our available resources? And the state has a lot of land sitting around at this point to maximum benefit. Um, money was the biggest thing that disappeared along with all the other um, economic activity in other industries, including the construction industry. Revenue declined, and we were faced with uh, really terrible decisions. Do we cut from the budget specific programs that are going to be helping people? Do we raise taxes, which nobody wants to see? Um, and, and we're trying to think out of the box in a lot of ways. And this was one of those ideas that came about um, which kind of blended the two. So the debate coming into this, um, and there were many, many versions of the bill before it ended up as, as the, the PLDC that we know today, uh, centered around these questions. And what we found uh, at the end of the day was 
that there was enough of a consensus, particularly in the budget side, to try and raise money from other places to push something like this ahead. And at the same time, um, there was uh, enough drive from particular uh, senators and representatives um, who've always been gung ho on, on, on streamlining the procurement process and permitting and environmental review and all sorts of stuff to try and incorporate some of those ideas into this. And so you came out at the end of the day with PLDC. Um, now that's kind of the, the broad overview of how it came to be. It's far more complex in the, the legislative process is, you know, the, the standard cliche is making sausage, right? Everything goes in and what comes out. You really don't want to know how it's made. Um, but uh, at the time, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of debate. And there wasn't a whole lot of discussion over some of these issues because uh, the way the process works is very compact. The legislature starts in January, you have 60 days through the beginning of May where you know, 3,000 plus bills potentially are debated, uh, voted on, passed, etc. And so it doesn't give a lot of time to review particularly complex detailed um, you know, works such as this. Complicating that, you have the ability um, to regularly gut and replace bills to change the language radically from one committee to the next. And this particular bill actually started out as something totally different as uh, something relating to education and schools and school supplies, uh, as I kind of recall. It went to another committee, it was turned into a, a bill about gambling, and then eventually ended up in a third committee and the development language was placed in it. And so along the way, you didn't have a whole lot of um, focus on this particular bill as being one that's going to generate a whole bunch of controversy at the end of it. There were other bills which did similar things and other um, uh, exemptions from environmental review that were moving along that, that got a lot more focus at the time. And you had the environmental community coming, coming out, stepping forward, um, uh, pointing at these things, saying what's going on. You had the uh, construction industry on the other side, uh, along with uh, other folks. Um, and, and this kind of was a last minute uh, development. I mean, it was truly kind of the 11th hour where this bill finally coalesced in its final form in, the, in one of the last um, weeks of the legislative session. And I remember actually at the time, um, it came out of a committee and about 48 hours later it was on the floor for a vote, along with that particular day about 160 other bills, I think. And this one was you know, 30 or 40 pages, many of them were. And quite frankly and honestly, we try to read everything we can, but there's no way you can get through it. Um, I think it was something like 60,000 pages of material I've had to read to have gone through everything and, it, and all the prior testimony and all that stuff added together. And it's just not going to happen. Let so that be a note for all of your reading assignments. <laughs> <that now. laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean you can't do it. Let me just say that. And, and uh, so anyway, uh, what we tend to do, uh, or common practice, is that you find folks who have an interest in a particular subject matter area who are credible who you know do their due diligence and do the research, and you kind of rely on them to say, hey, this bill over here, um, you know, take interest in it, it's got some issues, red flags, or it's great and fantastic. And you rely on those folks to start pointing things out. And everybody has their, their particular area they take interest in. Um, this one had slipped through the cracks, and at the end of the day, I remember um, we were about to vote on it, literally probably like two minutes away from the vote coming up, and the bill, by the time we got to it, started reading through the final amendments that had been made, I think I got to page like eight or nine. At that point, the vote was about to be called, and uh, said, "Okay, well, I'm going to vote against it because there were uh, similar language that raised concerns, and at this point, um, there's no way I can justify uh, putting my stamp on this, not knowing really what came out of it." Uh, so there were, I think, nine votes in the House opposed to the bill as it went out, and I think maybe one or two in the Senate. Quite recall. One in the Senate. One. Um, and the bill passed out. The governor signed into law. And that was, uh, from our perspective, the end of it. Or so we thought. <laughs> and so what happened, of course, um, from there on, I think Marty will be able to take over and, and uh, sounds like from the community's perspective, give an explanation of, of how it was received thereafter. But um, that was kind of the, the very basic 20,000 foot overview as to uh, sort of the issues that framed it and how it kind of came about. Um, there's going to be, I think, a pretty good discussion about this. I don't want to dominate the time. I think pass it on at this point. So at that point, I think Ian Land wrote
wrote an article and a bunch of like they did what? <laughs> and thus started the firestorm. So we can all blame Ian Lent. Go check his blog if you're interested in politics in Hawaii. And his cat, his blog is very, very interesting. Um, I think it's I, letter I, Lynn, like Island, but L I N D, um, dot com. Anyway, it's a very, yeah. very useful blog. Um, and he actually was the one um, I credit for raising everyone's um, alarm, alarms and alerts about, about legislation. Um, and it really was exactly as the representative described it, where in, at the beginning, I think it actually was a boat bill, like for boat harbors, and I was like, well, that's not in my area, so I don't have to worry about that one. And then it goes through a committee, and it's like school supplies, I'm like, well, that's not my area, I'm looking at this bill. And I think it went through enough of those variations that it was able to get to the seat that is the, uh, the oversight of the legislature and the um, basically cockroach race that is um, the legislative process. Um, and from the public's perspective and the community, from those of us who have expressed concern about this whole premise, um, it basically comes down to uh, a philosophy of government. And in Hawaii, we have a philosophy of government that public participation matters. And when you have a corporation like the PLDC, where its basis is in the concept of exemptions from public process, we have a problem. Uh, the reality is that in Hawaii, unlike other places, no matter how great public private partnerships have been there, in Hawaii, we have a very unique property scheme here. We have a history unlike any other place. And that history brings obligation. We have an obligation to protect what are referred to as public trust lands. These are lands that are held in trust with the people of Hawaii because Hawaii was overthrown. We weren't properly annexed to the United States of America. And the questionable history of our land ownership gives rise to this legal obligation. I mean, it's really, it is the basis of the compact between the U.S. and the state of Hawaii. It's this idea that all of the land is public, all was referred to, it's, it's the crown and government land of the Kingdom of Hawaii, and sometimes it produced TD land. These lands, because they have questionable title, are held in trust for Native Hawaiians in particular and the public as a whole. And with that obligation means the government can't just make willy-nilly decisions, ones that might raise revenue uh, and make someone rich, because they have more of an obligation to the people of Hawaii and to protecting the corpus of that trust than, than in the other states. So one of the mechanisms for ensuring uh, that, that the corpus of that trust is protected is public participation in decision making. And uh, I hope all of you have had the opportunity to read the uh, opinion piece put out by Professor Antolini talking about uh, the Moon Court and the decisions made, uh, especially in environmental cases, where really the focus there was in ensuring that we had full quality public participation in the decisions that we make about our public trust land. Uh, and our environment in general. Um, so that's basically where the, the issue arises. Um, I take issue with the concept of being able to exempt either certain agencies or certain developers or certain landowners <coughs> from laws because those laws have a purpose. They have been developed over time in reaction to uh, decisions that were made that people now see with 2020 hindsight weren't the best decisions to make, and they say, next time we ought to pass a law <laughs> that prevents people from doing this. And really, you, you don't have to look much farther than the Land Use Commission. The Land Use Commission was formed specifically in response to the siting of a landfill on agricultural land in a native Hawaiian community. And they said, hmm, maybe you shouldn't be allowed to do this. Next time, we'll require zoning and say, ag land here, urban here, conservation there, and trying to actually have sound land use policies that prevent Native Hawaiian communities from being unfairly exposed to demolition waste, to construction waste. Uh, it's those kinds of poor decision making in the past has given rise to things like the Land Use Commission. And it's things like the Land Use Commission, designations they put on land, that developers want to try to get around. And I don't think they should be allowed to get around them. If you have a good idea, if it's going to really make Hawaii a better place, if it's really going to build workforce housing and employ 
employ lots of people, then it should be able to make it to the gauntlet that is the public permitting process. And, uh, and I will agree, I will concede to a very small degree <laughs> that maybe there is some <laughs> delay in the way in which permitting is issued, especially at the county level. But let's address that, you know, in and of itself. Let's address the permitting process, see what things we can streamline and make go better. I mean, I for one have been in line with DMV. I'm like, why can I not fill this format online? I do not know. And I feel like there are things, um, and efficiency-wise, that we could do better in terms of those kinds of permitting processes and licenses. Uh, but exemption is uh, a bridge too far. And really, we should uh, figure out better ways and means to ensure complete and full compliance with the laws that were established to protect public health and the public health interest. And that's basically my perspective. Thank you. I uh, am a, was not the original invitee to this panel. My partner, Robert Thomas, uh, who blogs a bunch on real estate, uh, property law, condemnation, um, he couldn't make it and he asked me to step in. And for some reason, every time I come up here, it's always to defend the evil developer <laughs> <laughs> and to pave, to, to pave over uh, for our beautiful state. And uh, it's kind of ironic because I spent uh, many years in the Coast Guard cleaning up oil spills and uh, I had a big hand in setting up the, um, or helping set up the regulations for the Northwest Hawaiian Islands uh, Coral Reef Preserve back in the day, uh, et cetera. And so it's kind of an ironic situation. But when, what's funny is when I first got the uh, invite to the panel, I was like, PLDC, uh, they really had it kind of looked on our radar, and because uh, it is brand new. And um, uh, it was, I, I think, just looking at the statute, and then the statute just sets up a corporation to, uh, uh, deal with the development or, or use of um, public land. I think it was pretty vague, and that's probably why uh, it got a lot of people up in arms. And, and so I think back, I live in Chris's district in Kailua, and within about a mile and a half from my house, we have three elementary schools. Um, so they're each about three quarters of a mile away from each other. And uh, Kailua is an aging community now. Um, the growth or the population is all in Mililani and Eva and, and out on the west side. And so the schools are more than half empty. And um, it's kind of like, boy, I look at this huge urban land, uh, eight, 10 acres each. Uh, I look at these buildings, this infrastructure. It's all wired, massive internet. Um, it's used to having people come in and out of it. And I was like, isn't there some way or something that we could uh, do to reutilize these uh, buildings and uh, get Giving up elementary schools is a challenge. Most communities fight that. I think the last one really close was on Oahu was uh, Wailupe, and it was huge uh, public outcry about it. But um, I'm not sure what's happened on that side since. And so there's a kind of a question that the state does own a lot of land, and the, what should we do with it? Um, and, and should we reuse it from, you know, do I want watersheds converted? No. Do I want conservation land converted? No. But there are a lot of urban zone lands that um, are underutilized and could be utilized in a more economically productive way. And not just for the rich luxury condo developers where they're going to take their millions back to Wall Street, but you know, tech hubs, innovation centers, and whatnot. So, I don't know. I think as a community, and this is not lawyer talking, as a community, we can tolerate and have a discussion about better ways to use the land the state has. Now, when I looked at the PLDC statute, one thing that kind of popped my eye and, and caught my eye, and it's really important in the context of both this as well as Rail Project and others, is that the public-private partnership, uh, and that is the way a lot of projects get developed uh, on the mainland these days. And um, the classic public-private partnership that um, I was personally involved with re related to a luxury development on the Big Island called Bukalia. Some of you uh, are familiar with Hokulia, some of you aren't. Uh, Hokulia is uh, South Kona, uh, Kalakua area, uh, and it had, you know, most of Kona is ag land. Um, back when the land was classified, uh, the default was ag, and so you have lava field upon lava field where nothing would ever grow, but it's an ag, uh, and that was kind of the default. And so uh, we had someone with these huge lava fields and wanted to create a hyper-luxury, world-class Donald Trump golf course uh, and have, I think it's one acre, <coughs> two acre type of uh, gentleman's estate um, and uh, centered around this huge uh, golf 
golf club. So this mainline developer uh, comes in and uh, does a public-private partnership called the development agreement, the first development agreement um, ever done in the state of Hawaii. The statute was drafted by the person who was on this golf club. <laughs> <laughs> And it required, um, traffic is bad, uh, there's not a lot of, they have a lot of, um, they need a lot more roads in the Big Island than they actually have, and uh, uh, there was only one road going through that area, the Mamalahoa Highway, and uh, so before the county was going to let this huge development come in with uh, you know, 100 homes or whatever, uh, they wanted the developer to agree to create a bypass road uh, to alleviate some of the congestion. And uh, so the developer said, okay, I'm willing to do that. You know, roads aren't that expensive to build. But the problem is that the bypass road extended across other people's land, not just the developers. And so the developer said, well, I'll agree to that in my, in my development agreement. But what happens if I have to build a road on this person's land or that person's land? What if they don't agree to sell it to me? What do I do then? Uh, I can't take this to my investors in Japan and on Wall Street unless I have the power to take that land. And so the county said, well, we have free road. And so they agreed in the development agreement that um, at the developer's request, request, <coughs> they shall condemn any property along that right of way that they needed for that developer's uh, road that he had to build. And, it was, and he had to build it. Uh, he wanted to upzone it and make it more uh, dense uh, zoning. So most people uh, made the deal, Bishop State made a deal, all the other neighboring landowners made the deal. One of my clients, who happened to be in real estate development in his past, um, and owned a, a large chunk of the land, uh, or twice on the Cherry Island, says, that's not fair. How should that guy, uh, this mainland developer, get the power to take my land, at, and the county's going to use their eminent domain power, and uh, that there's something wrong with that? And uh, this happened to be a uh, 2000 time frame. So uh, at the counties, there, were, uh, there was, they tried to negotiate an acquisition. They couldn't come to terms. So the developer told the county to condemn the land, and they did. Um, in 2000, they passed a condemnation resolution that said, we signed a contract with the developer. Uh, we're going to, and we have to obey it. So you know, here's the meets and bounds, condemn the land. A little, little bit of litigation, and then uh, in 2005, the United States Supreme Court said that um, in the Kilo versus Susan and London case, which I don't know if you guys have read yet, but um, said that while economic redevelopment takings um, are in public use to satisfy the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, um, not all uh, condemnations, the public use still has power. It still is an element of uh, our protections, our property protections, and so Courts, uh, and you have to kind of read the, the, the concurring opinion of the Senate to kind of cobble together what the inquiry is, and it's a, it's a very ripe area of litigation ever since then. But uh, we argue that it breathes new life into the public use requirement in the, for the Fifth Amendment. And so uh, we challenged the public use of the taking and said, look, there's no public use. You're helping this private developer. And um, we took that up and we tried it in 2007, and uh, Judge Ibarra agreed with us that in the resolution it says this is pursuant to this contract we have, that's a private uh, use, and uh, uh, that the public use a road, and your, your colleague uh, disagrees with this aspect of our case, but um, greatest time ever, <laughs> let me just interject here, when you have to do the deposition preparation question for one of your law professors, <laughs> <laughs> Judge Ibarra in Kona said that it was a pretext, you know, the, the developer had to create the road, the county, you know, there was no independent judgment here, the contract says they shall condemn. Um, and uh, the other little side aspect of the case uh, was in 2005, having had so much trouble um, with litigation, the county council passed another resolution condemning the same property, saying, well, 
we really need this as a public road, never mind what we said earlier about the development. <laughs> 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 and so we tried that. We tried the cases together. We tried to get it kicked um, on a couple different civil procedure type grounds. And uh, um, uh, Judge Barr agreed that there was a valid public use, and uh, it was for a public road eventually. And uh, so we took that up to the Supreme Court, uh, and we said, look, uh, it's a pretext. It's the same darn road. It, it, here's all the same facts. The county council can't just paper it by putting different words on the resolution than the earlier one. Uh, and the Supreme Court, uh, in a three to two decision, uh, agreed and said that we have the ability to do discovery and inquire. And the judge had to find facts about what was really going on behind this condemnation. And uh, so we went back to Judge Ibarra. It's always awkward, you know, win an appeal and you gotta go back to the same judge. <laughs> so, uh, of course, he didn't change his mind and he said, no, it is a valid public use. There's all these traffic studies, they had horrible traffic in Kona. And uh, we went back to the Hawaii Supreme Court and 5 to 0 we lost. So, um, anyway, long story short, I view public private partnerships as um, uh, being something we have to be careful of because while it is a way that uh, cash poor governments can accomplish their public uh, needs and, and aims. Public transportation projects, uh, the, the cable to Molokai to bring electricity here, whatever, uh, public affordable housing. Um, private property rights for the neighborhood folks. I was talking about the elementary school example earlier. Uh, let's say that there's, uh, they need to have a, 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 they do a, a public private partnership on Kealekula Elementary. Go with it. <laughs> uh, the parking lot's too small, and they might need to have a different access road. And so, but there's, there's it's all houses nearby. So why don't we condemn one of the houses so we have a good fire truck access or another? What's, what's your address? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to blame. So how would you feel that you know the state made a deal with? you know, Forest City or, or some other uh, place to do some kind of a commercial uh, tech park, um, and they, they, the county's going to require them, or the state's going to require them, or just traffic needs are going to require them to have another driveway, and now your house is in the way, and they get to decide that, and they can make their millions, and you've lived there for your whole life, and your grandparents live there. So, um, that being said, you know, the land is for the living, and we have tough economic times. You look at the median house price, and you look at the median starting salary for attorneys, much less teachers or farmers. Um, you know, okay, maybe you can afford to live here. Your children can be able to afford to live here. And those are the tough, vexing issues which I'm glad we have such good representatives like Chris Lee to kind of deal with. Because I do think we're going to need to look at this issue. I do think that we're going to need to find a way to make sure that the land the state does have is used to its fullest potential. And uh, the land is sensitive and needs to be protected in. So, there are other examples of the government. The government owns a lot of land, um, and uh, query whether or not, in my example, the Department of Education is the best people to be developing or making uh, real estate development decisions. I suggest they're probably not. Their job is to educate the kids. And so, you know, conceptually, is there an issue with uh, creating a corporation, putting real estate developer folks in there, and, and seeing, you know, if there's a way that land can be better used. I think conceptually we have to agree that that's yeah. sound. Now, again, I think some of the things that Marty brought up are problematic. Um, I don't think they're insurmountable. I do think that um, real estate development and uh, permit delays and the Land Use Commission and zoning process does attribute to the higher cost of development. Um, and we have to address that somehow. Uh, I think housing in Hawaii are too expensive. And uh, it impacts everything. It impacts your children. It impacts you know, my rate that I charge to my clients. You know, we have a floor of the building in uh, downtown Honolulu, and our rent is fifty thousand dollars a month. Uh, that's a lot of money. And uh, doctors. The reason why doctors uh, have a tough time in Hawaii. And, you know, I don't think it's anything to do with medical malpractice or court reform. I think it's to do with the highest rents in the country. I, I, I waxed a little off of the policy, I'm sorry. Uh. <laughs> uh, some of the things that I'm hearing, and I'd like to then open it up to the panel to, to respond to each other, <coughs> respond to my observation, <coughs> is that I'm hearing you say there was a lot of 
vagueness in the statute. At least that was your observation. And it seems as though there, uh, and I have not looked at the statute, but from what I understand, there are certain bypasses of regular process that are allowed to occur. Here's the all land use From all land All zoning requirements. requirements. But that's not DHHL does too. They're except for county building codes. And, you know, some of the, the government isn't going to build a non-building code compliant uh, building. Uh, government buildings are used as sanctuaries in disasters. And so, um, you know, it, it, nobody's going to ensure a non-building code compliant building. So, you know, some of it, while I agree, it, it's a red flag. Um, if you're talking about my example of schools, this is already urban land. So if it's close to the water, you can get close to the and I can still, you know, I think still would apply. But I think there's a concern that the more you, uh, the more roadblocks you put in uh, to the development process, the slower it's going to be, and Wall Street's not going to fund it. Well, and, and the other observation that I would make is that it seems as though there might be a lack of trust going on here uh, that is probably fueled from some history, uh, and so how do you respond, how do you get past that when you've got this, this idea of reusing property or making better use and trying to get uh, a group who is experienced in real estate, in land development, to make decisions and involve community as well? what's the best way as Representative Lee has to go back and try to draft something in nice. response. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave those questions open. You know, I, there is certainly a history, I think, uh, particularly surrounding projects that have popped up over the years that have uh, horribly awry, or processes that have ended up in litigation endlessly. And I think the one thing that's probably true, correct me if I'm, you guys feel differently, I think over the years has been consistent that communities particularly um, rise up in protests when they feel like they've been cut out of the process. Uh, I think that's true whether it's a super ferry, whether it's, you know, whatever, whatever the issue has been. Um, and this is one of those that particularly kind of encapsulated a lot of those different concerns in one um, focused bill, or one, one law, I should say. You know, there's, there, and Mark raised some good points. Uh, I mean, I think no one's going to say that all is well there's no opportunity for um, you know, streamlining processes and uh, utilizing land best. Everybody generally agrees. It's how we get there, that's the question. And there's just a couple of policy things I wanted to bring up briefly, um, uh, which kind of play into a lot of this and, and kind of wrap up by answering the question that was posed earlier. But ultimately, I mean, and Marty touched on this, is from a policy perspective, how do we use our land? And prior to this, there were a number of debates over the sale of public land state land, uh, land which here is held in public trust for the benefit of the wine, et cetera. Um, and we really tried to step back from that collectively as a legislature passing, uh, uh, I can't remember the year, it was Act 176, which required legislative oversight of the sale of public land, uh, following a number of questionable uh, actions on the part of the government. And this also played into the PLDC bill, really, depending on which draft you're looking at, the corporation had the ability to go out uh, and sell it, for example, without any sort of oversight um, on the part of the legislature anyway. And that raised <coughs> concerns because ultimately, if this is going to be a policy question, holding this in trust, how can we, on the, on the uh, merits of trying to raise money for the state, sell this now? Because if we're going to do that every time there's a recession, we'll be selling off land and eventually there'll be nothing left. And ultimately, the one thing that is passed on historically here is the corpus of the land from one generation to the next, through state and county governments, et cetera. Um, the permitting issues that have been brought up, I think, um, are definitely legit. I mean, there was a task force, uh, there were a number of tasks. Tasks, task forces, yeah. task force, <laughs> uh, which were brought up over the years. And <coughs> going into the recession, there were all these great ideas, like legitimately awesome ideas for how to actually push projects further along faster while maintaining um, some form of oversight while maintaining the building codes and making sure everybody's doing things by the book. And actually almost none of these things passed into law prior to this bill. Like almost none of them. 
And so the question that's raised is, well, okay, so why? Why this particular uh, mechanism? Why this way? And uh, that's the question that was posed um, sort of in retrospect to the governor, to uh, the legislature, to others um, as to why this. And uh, there were really, um, from my perspective, I didn't get answers from uh, either the administration or my colleagues as to why. Because the question when you boil down to it is, okay, if this is going to be it, um, obviously there are concerns raised. Um, why not address those concerns and put it in statute in the bill? Why not, this was in, in the context of coming back the following year for a kind of fix-it bill to address a lot of this. Um, and there was just absolute, um, and again, this is my own opinion, my own experience here, but absolute um, uh, hesitation puts it lightly, to doing anything like that. And that further raised the question in the back of my head, okay, so why? You know what I mean? If people are concerned about um, schools uh, and, and the opportunities that there are for redeveloping school properties to the benefit of schools in the state, for example, fine, let's write that into the bill and limit the, the focus of the bill, the scope, to these particular projects or properties. Why do we encompass all this other land in the state? I mean, what's the reason there? And finally, really gets to, so, okay, so what are the real reasons? And this is purely a political thing on the policy side, and, um, you know, it's just me saying this based on my experiences, and I can't point to any sort of legislative history that's officially on record. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, these were the concerns that were raised by the folks lobbying for the bill at the time um, as justification for passing it. And it was um, definitely liability in the part of contractors who have done projects in the past, they do a shot and they get to uh, <coughs> back in and fix it and things like that. Um, and different versions of the bill would limit that liability. Um, there was definitely concern that um, uh, the Marty Townsends of the world would, would hmm. sue to stop particular projects on environmental grounds. <laughs> and um, there, was, there was a real um, reason, and <coughs> shouldn't be a justification to stop the project. We shouldn't let it go to the courts um, to have that happen. And that was one of the things that was continually repeated. The community uh, out, uh, meetings and input was definitely something that there was a lot of concern over because anytime, and this was uh, again on the heels of the super Bowl, which was ultimately sunk by the same kind of public outcry. Uh, which Actually, it was sunk by its own court. Yes, well, let me say it was brought up. They said to the failing. So it wasn't the law that sunk them. It was the fact that they couldn't get enough people to ride the bomb at Comic Vista. Yes. I'm not sure. But let me say it was passed the Texas law for the Super Ferry on the heels of public support and opinion, which said, you know, what's going on. So, anyway, um, uh, and the last thing, so so setting aside community meetings, getting, getting a couple exemptions from some of those where you could get clear controversy coming up which could stall the project potentially and politically. And then the last thing was talking about specific projects um, which were identified um, saying, okay, we want to build these projects, so how can we tailor the bill for these? And there were definitely a handful of <coughs> um, uh, which you know, it's not public and it's not on record, but these are some of the drivers. These are the reasons why the bill was left in a way so broad. And that's why you had so much concern brought up. So anyway, I just wanted to give that back <coughs> uh, from my perspective on the policy side is to answer just maybe a little bit of the question uh, that was raised earlier. Marty, um, I have a couple of things kind of running in my thoughts. First, I just want to be very clear that this isn't unique. The, in terms of the PLBC, this isn't about public-private partnerships per se. This isn't about smart use of land per se. This is about developers, wealthy people, whether local or from the mainland, taking advantage of public outcry to serve their own interests. They got exemptions from the laws that they didn't like, and they used the core <coughs> of streamlining a better public process, or streamlining and, and workforce development, workforce housing development, um, as a way to justify that. And let's just be very, very clear about that. I mean, even those people who are you know, how the proponents of public private partnerships talk about the need to really follow the law and 
So let's just separate those two because when it comes down to it, when a project is done well, follows all the laws, it doesn't get dragged into court. It doesn't get hung up in controversy. And there are plenty of examples that probably you've never heard of because they never once get a, you know, a day in a newspaper because there was no controversy about it. They did really good public outreach, they followed all the laws, they got all the permits, and they built the project and everything was done well. And you can look in downtown Kaka'ako for just those examples. The Hung developers, um, William Horn, I think, just developed, uh, has fit, finished one workforce housing development, 100% workforce housing. I think he's been in the paper once and it was totally a positive article. And he's working on a second one. And the point is, is that there, it is possible for developments to be done in Hawaii and be done right and not be uh, drug into court. The ones that get drug into court are the ones that either don't follow the law or haven't followed the process. Uh, we're not talking solely about the sale of land. We're talking about all kinds of dispositions of land. There are lots of things you can do to a parcel. And Hawaii has seen that when we give these sweetheart deals of long-term leases to developers, they can have long-term impacts even without ever selling a piece of land. So never triggering Act 176, never getting in trouble with selling out the public trust resources, uh, but still robbing the public of the full use and their rights in terms of public trust land. So there are a lot of things that developers could do um, outside of buying, selling, condemning uh, land that would still undermine public best interest. And it's important to think broadly like that because they're thinking broadly. I'd like to also, um, highlighted uh, past attempts to try to streamline the process, and there actually have been an attempts to implement that. Uh, the Office of Environmental Quality and Control, which is the entity that's supposed to um, ensure that environmental impact statements are done correctly, uh, has uh, implemented rulemaking that allows agencies to identify those activities that are, are not likely to have a significant impact to then have a streamlined review process. So they don't have to do, uh, you know, the classic example given of, I have to do an EIS because I want to install the drain. Uh, no longer do you have those kinds of situations. Uh, and instead you have um, agencies that have expertise in their areas, know what activities they're going to undertake, and know the impact, like the impacts of those activities are exempted from, uh, they're called exceptions, there are exceptions from uh, Chapter 343 and it ensures streamlined, solid public government. Um, and so, and while I support those kinds of um, really targeted, well thought out, and genuine public processes to streamline things, those exceptions go through um, Chapter 91 public rulemaking and there's all kinds of hearings and it's well vetted and it becomes a solid system that you never hear about in the newspaper because it's, it's well done. Um, so I, I really see the PLBC as being something where people who are uh, looking to exploit Hawaii's land took advantage of a situation and uh, to, to the detriment of the public. And it's really been a public outcry that has uh, at least brought to the table that we're going to repeal this bill and we're going to start over. No one's opposed to the idea of using public land smartly. No one's opposed to the idea of um, evolving with the times, letting elementary schools be used to their fullest extent possible. What we are opposed to are private developers taking advantage of Hawaii, leaving us um, poorer, thicker, and less well off than we were before they got here. And these kinds of laws that, for one, ensure that they uh, follow the law, and then two, ensure that there's legitimate, genuine public process are the two mechanisms for ensuring that. I mean, uh, Professor Sasser asked, how do we get over the trust issue? And my immediate answer was, make them get a permit. You know, <laughs> the EIS, that's a full confession document, right? This is not enforceable. The thing that makes it enforceable is the permit that comes after that, right? So you have to get a conservation district use permit in order to build in a conservation district, for example, right? Okay, you have to get an EIS because you're required to get this permit. And in the permit they say all of the promises you made to make to say how you're gonna minimize and mitigate all the horrible things that your project's gonna do, those now become conditions of the permit. If we don't do them, then I can see. So those are the kinds of ways in which you build trust given the fact that we are coming we are coming into this conversation having already been um, taken advantage of. Well, Thank you.
want to add anything to that before we open it up? Well, I'm interested in the conversation, so I don't know. <laughs> I'll get my opinion left and right if you ask a good question. Okay. <laughs> well, let's open it up to the audience then. Where's the PLDC now? We hear that it's uh, the repeal bills have been passed in both the House and the Senate, am I right? Yeah. I'll look at that. Sure. So um, the House has passed a bill over to the Senate. We're, we're about halfway through the Senate. 1133. House bills are going to the Senate. Senate bills are going to the House. So the House bill passed to the Senate. The Senate also passed a bill um, uh, which substantially repeals Act 55. Um, there are also a number of bills which are going to try and replicate PLDC or, or replace it in a certain way. Um, from very limited in scope, uh, focusing on things like just schools, for example. There's there's a bill, 21st Century Schools Bill, which is a governor's bill. It takes five, in its current form right now, it takes five school projects and does essentially what the PLDC is going to do, but for those purposes, I mean for those schools only, and for the purpose of benefiting uh, education. And with no intention. Yes, and, and it's very, I think, as a result of the PLDC discussion, very limited in scope and nature. There are other broader bills um, which try to, uh, in a way, replicate the PLDC. Um, there's a bill called the Public-Private Partnership Authority, which is moving through the Senate right now. It doesn't have the same sort of exemptions that the PLDC did, but it has the same sort of purpose and intent. And there are even broader bills which create, uh, for example, urban development um, planning uh, commissions, for example, which every five years come up with <coughs> planning uh, which supersedes all state and county uh, zoning laws, and etc. So there's all that stuff in the mix right now. The question is, what's going to come out at the end of the day? And, uh, we don't have that answer yet. We'll know in about a month and a half. I have a question, though. What, when you're talking about the exemptions, what laws specifically? <coughs> I get zoning. Yeah. Okay, but what are the other? It's land use designation, county zoning. Those are the two big ones that I was concerned about. Um, there's also building codes that me up recommended. We would also know yeah. as long. Um, I only focus on the ones that are in my. Well, what's the the concern is conservation land or? Sure. So, so um, once the bill was passed, there was uh, one particular project they identified, which was it fell into our district. Actually, uh, Old Mono Golf Course on the Windward side, um, which is uh, state land leased out, and that was identified as one of the first projects that could potentially go. With the exemption from county zoning, uh, or sorry, just zoning in general, and on the county side, other things, you could build pretty much anything you wanted there, uh, from whatever, a, a hotel to a casino to um, a dump, potentially, I mean, barring federal. EPA requirements and other things. But essentially it opens it up. And it does so um, while at the same time limiting uh, public input into the process because at many of those stages of uh, permitting or, or zoning or whatever, if you're changing land designation, for example, you're going to have a public hearing. And so a lot of the stuff is cut out. And so that's uh, some of the concerns, that you're going to have a change ultimately in the use of that land um, without uh, adequate public participation. Is it ag now? That particular property? I don't recall. Yeah, I, don't I don't recall. I, I think so, okay. Well, see, we hear a lot of uh, consternation these days about uh, uh, our old Hawaii changing into something new and we don't like it, it scares us. And, uh, you know, I grew up here, my father grew up here, my grandfather grew up here, and Nobody likes to see change, but when you kind of unpack uh, and recognize that, you know, what is declared ag land in all the maps isn't necessarily agricultural land. Um, if you go to Kailua, anyone know Kailua, but on the Malka side, right underneath Olmana, there's a pretty luxurious, um, uh, nice subdivision called Norfolk. And um, so there's these huge 10,000 square foot houses up in there. Uh, you can see it from the conning of the highway. Um, that's ag land. And uh, it's too mountainous uh, for anything to ever grow. But again, like I said, uh, back in the days when they classified all land, the sugar plantations were everywhere, and they wanted everything in ag so they get better uh, uh, property tax uh, you know, treatment. And they can make sugar grow with a labor force uh, in a lot of different places. And so uh, 
we have a, way more ag land than we know what to do with that we would need. And so I, I think before we, I don't say blindly, but before we always say you're, you're, you're changing classification from ag to urban, we need to kind of unpack and say, was that land ever going to be used for ag? Is there any viable purpose for it? I have a client who's a very large landowner in a local company um, on Maui, and they got more ag land than they have to do with it. It's funny because when you go to the neighbor island, uh, when you, when you when they hear about all the talk about Coal Ridge and um, what's it called, uh, Cold Pulu, uh, they're like, you, you, you know, it's food security. We, uh, we need to have our own food security. And he's like, look, you guys want to start a farm? I'll give you five acres, I'll give you a hundred acres, I'll give you a thousand acres. Uh, you know, I'll give you six months to your rent. And uh, so, if it's the conversation about, you know, the need for food security, the need to uh, make sure our farmers are, are um, that's great. Let's have the conversations have a lot. We import too much food. If it's just to stop development, because we don't like development, you know, that's a different inquiry. And uh, I think there's different issues at stake there. I think if your if your concern is about whether ag land is designated ag for ag for agricultural use is actually agricultural land, then that's something that you should take on squarely, as opposed to just allowing broad exemptions from land use designations. Let's do some, let's form a task force, and let's do some research and figure out what land is actually zoned, or uh, designated for ag use that's actually potentially for, less for ag use. But um, I don't think that we should uh, fall victim to the, the false logical conclusion that because some land might be even designated as ag, <coughs> that therefore all land is open, all ag land is open for redesignation. Uh, we do have a lot of land that's open and available, and the reality is, is that once we cover it over concrete, we will never get it back. And so we need to make those decisions very, very cautiously. But there are other governmental entities and governmental lands that don't have to, um, Hawaiian homelands don't have to climb the zoning. Um, but they're also defined class land. I mean, and maybe that's, that's the problem. problem. Maybe that's the problem is they need to uh, define it well. The, the problem is that, that unpacking what category of land the state has is a very political, uh, delicate thing because, you know, we have seeded lands, um, and they both talked about the seeded lands trust, and, and uh, there are a lot of uh, statutory and constitutional, and the Section 5, I think, of the Admission Act, which uh, are the enumerated uses on which the state can use land. They apply in protection of them as one. Education and the general population economic is, is other, and so um, I think that just getting a catalog of what land the state owns and what you know what its historical title is uh, is a political minefield, and so it's one of these oh let's just you know come up with a list of land before you do that. It, it, it tends to be um, an insurmountable task that will never get solved. Let me send this back to the audience, sir. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> well, my understanding is that the amount of land covered under the DLNR or PLDC is about 2 million acres. And as a comparison, uh, Kamehameha Schools Bishop Estate total land holdings is about 360,000. So we're talking about a lot of land, uh, almost 2 million acres, 97% of which is ceded lands or crown lands, as Marty um, mentioned. Now, my question, I guess, would be to to Mark, but to anyone else as well, is that you seem to be saying that the PLDC or some kind of PLDC-like thing, entity, is actually a desirable thing. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but I kind of do. Um, and if that's the case, tell us uh, why you think that is a good thing. You know, to be frank, I've learned a lot more. I didn't read the statute until last week when I got the invite. Um, uh, I think that from a governance, and I've spent a lot of time as a government attorney, and, and they have a little bit. Being gov in government, you have different objectives and needs than creating private practice taking care of one person. From the government's perspective, if I was to create, look at our state government, and I would try to find out who are the best people, who are the best bureaucrats to walk through a process to see re redevelopment of state owned lands, I don't look at the, the existing departments and see that core knowledge that I think you need to have. Um, the, 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 the planner types who can go into the community and, and, and work through the process and, and 
uh, identify what the infrastructure needs are and what the community needs are and community desires are. And so uh, the concern I have is that I, I think it makes sense conceptually to uh, create a, a governmental entity that does have, you can put the, the, the people in who have that expertise and specialty and not rely on this individual department. Um, when you listed off some of those uh, land holdings, uh, sure, uh, the state owns this land. I don't think they're going to redevelop the University of Hawaii or the Honolulu National Airport or uh, you know, the state capitol building. And so I think that um, it falls back to this vague problem that I think that because nobody knew what they were dealing with, you know, the, the statute's you know, so broad and could apply in so different ways, even if it wasn't what it was intended, whatever that was. So I, I think if Mark, King Mark, we're going to design a government. Yeah, sure. Let's you know let's, make, let's put all the land use planners and, and make sure we're, we're uh, doing it right. Those are not without controversy. Uh, California had redevelopment uh, authorities up and down the coast and uh, coast, the coast where at, but uh, <laughs> up and down the uh, west coast, and uh, there was a lot of abuse and. Um, there was a lot of patronage, and it got so bad that they did away with them last year after 25 years. And it was billions of dollars that these people had in these redevelopment authorities and um, uh, did away with them. They once fell swoop. And it was some Supreme Court case, and uh, the legislature, or the California Assembly, defunded them, and it was defunded and gone. And uh, so, huge problems. There's huge uh, exposure to a lot of uh, patronage and, and political games. But yeah, conceptually, you know, let's, I, I, I fall back on, I, I want, I don't want to have the one big project. Like, we always seem to love the one big project. The governor announces, I should announce this recording yet, but, uh, you know, we have to build the biggest tower in Kakaako for all this affordable housing. I don't know why we can't have a hundred small projects, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's the classic Hawaii thing, and, and we always, we saw that on the Big Island with my whole case, it was, there was only one developer who was going to save all the traffic on the big island. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, let, let, let's, let's foster that. And, you know, no, I was going to say, that's exactly the question. I mean, you talk about vagueness and intent. Of course, uh, I mean, I think even the most uh, cynical among us don't think the PLBC was created to develop, you know, our beach parks and, and all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, top of Mauna Kea, for example, was raised. Uh -huh. like that. I mean, yeah. clearly, you know, way out of bounds. But what's to say that, and, and this governor and, and um, the folks involved in PLDC, you know, pledge this is absolutely not our intent. Uh, we have no intention of, of moving with anything like that in controversial, which is fine. The question then comes back to okay, so let's put that control back in the statute again so that no matter what, you can. And if the governor changes, which you know, is going to be for eight years, the next guy is not going to be someone who's going to try to take advantage of that. And so that was really roped back into it. And just getting back into, uh, you know, how do we, yes, there's legitimate purpose here. Uh, still to this day, I mean, the legislature probably going to push something out to try and tackle some of these issues. But at the end, the question is, it needs to be asked with separately, you know, and the question of agland, how do we preserve that? That is a question unto itself that needs to be addressed. And the question of how do we streamline permitting and make development easier uh, more applicable. That's a separate question. Uh, in fact, um, Mark mentioned a, a really great idea. One of the recommendations from prior years was create essentially an ombudsman uh, or an office to really walk developers through the process and, and hold handhold uh, and be able to, to make sure that there's a connection there. It's not, you know, the permit's not just lost in the abyss. In fact, one of the things, I mean, the, the premise for a lot of this is resting on the fact that there are these um, gaps in the process where projects will get uh, proposed and, and you'll have your environmental uh, reviews going and then something happens. Nobody really knows what and then like five years later you're out of money and there's all kinds of problems. Um, if you actually look at the number of projects, I mean, we've gone through dozens and dozens of, in over the last about five, six years of uh, public and uh, public-private partnership projects. You break down the timelines from when the application for whatever permit X was sent, submitted, the expected time frame versus the actual time frame, the, the review process period, the public comment. What you find is that actually a lot of it is held up by government itself, not because um, 
not because the the review process is taking too long, but because somebody just put it in a drawer and that's the end of it. So the question is, is the solution from a policy perspective going to be, okay, we'll just go around that office completely in that review period, or do we actually try and fix this and say, okay, so why did this review take five years? You're supposed to have it done in 90 days. All you had to do was literally sign off on the bottom and you didn't. What's the problem? So anyway, it gets into a, a lot of stuff like that. Let, let me just ask one quick question because what I'm hearing with the designation of various uh, land holdings, uh, how does the state do this? Do you do this on a county level to do a general plan? In California, we have our municipalities are required to do a general plan, and those have to be updated, and it generally involves community coming together and looking at it to update, to say this shouldn't be at work. Yeah. Well, when the Landing Commission was established, they had three buckets. And between the late 60s and the early 1970s, they put all the land in one of those buckets. And if you own one of those pieces of land, and you look at what bucket you're in, you're like, I don't want to be in this bucket, I want to be in that bucket. You went to Landing Commission, and you petitioned to have your land be designated. And what often happened was a farmer had his land in the agricultural bucket, um, and then uh, got bought out many years later, and the guy now owns it as a developer, and he bought it because it's really cheap land, and he said, you know, really great here, do not cow pasture, but hotel, right? And he says, I want to be in that bucket. And so then the developer takes a petition to the land commission, and, and we're going to be redesignated. <coughs> One of the controls on how land is redesignated is what's called the, the county-based community development project uh, uh, process. So there are plans that communities are supposed to uh, develop through long, drawn-out public processes uh, to identify, you know, industrial goes here, schools go there, homes go here, keep the beaches open, whatever. And uh, the challenge is, is that uh, the county in particular is um, very bad about issuing variances to those community developments. And so even though the community is trying to articulate to the outside world, this is what we want to see in our community, and invite developers to come in and do things along these lines, this plan outlines. Instead, developers have in their own mind what they want to do, and they will get a variance from the county, uh, from, the, from the community plan, and then we'll go to the Land Commission for redesignation. And uh, it's those kinds of projects where the developer is pushing against the flow, pushing against the uh, state desire of the community, that you have uh, a lot of litigation, uh, public outcry, and ultimately the project fail. <coughs> we have two um, zoning levels. The state has the land use classification is zoning, basically, um, and it has, so there's four broad categories. There is no, one of the fourth categories, there is no land in it, but there's a little more now. So all the entire state is uh, classified at the state line is question level. And then um, below that, the counties exercise home rule and zoning powers. And, uh, you know, throw into there the Coastal Zone Management Act, which we don't have, uh, it doesn't impact a lot on a lot, but it does on Maui, and, and the, the SMA is very far um, ashore on Maui. Special man what is it? Shoreline Management? Special Management Act. Coastal Zone Management Act. And um, there's a case, uh, I think it's called Gatchery versus Blaine. The Vice Supreme Court. She was talking about the community development plan is the general plan for the land. We used to call it general plan too. Um, but um, the Supreme Court said that in order to get an SMA permit, you have to be consistent with uh, the community development plan or the general plan um, and uh, ag zoning and whatnot. And uh, one of the challenges is that the community development plans change um, and uh, tend to be aspirational. On Maui, uh, they have a couple highways and they put a bunch of parks on people's land that was resort zoned. Um, and uh, so now you're, you're saying, okay, I have resort zone land, I should be able to build, let's say, a house or a small hotel or something. But um, the general plan now says park. Well, because it's in the special management area uh, and because of the Gatry versus Blaine decision, I can't get a permit, because a special management area permit, because the general plan says I'm a park. And yeah, it's aspirational, but I already have zoning. I, you know, my zone says I can build a, a small hotel here. And so uh, 
it's not without challenge and difficulty um, to walk through the process, and it is kind of hard to explain to mainland folks, uh, <laughs> mainland volunteers. And the final point I have is that, look, unless the, the challenge with funding big projects is that you can go in one of two ways. You can have the very wealthy uh, entities fund it, A and B, Michigan State, whatever. Or you can get a Donald Trump type guy, or like my guy, the Hulu guy, who takes it to Wall Street, investment banks, Lehman Brothers, or whatever. Says, okay, I have this project. I'm going to entitle it a little. Hey, you know, give me a hundred million dollars and build it. The challenge is the more impediments you have, um, and the less certainty you have, the Wall Street investment bankers aren't going to fund it. And uh, so that's one of the challenges. So then we're left with, look, if you can't take the, the, the project to Wall Street. Um, then you're left with only having AMB, Michigan State, um, you know, the state of Hawaii doing the development. And um, that might not always be the best thing for the economy. So I actually agree that businesses tend toward certainty, and the rules make certainty. And if you stop at issuing exemptions at the county level, right, stop issuing variances, right, so one developer comes in, right, does a little bit, does a deal, gets an variance from the county, and builds a tall building. The next developer comes in and says, he has a tall building, and right next door I should be able to build a tall building too, but he doesn't know the right guy, and doesn't know how to make the right deal, and so he doesn't get to build one, right? Okay, that kind of uncertainty is not the public's fault, okay? We advocated for and got past public laws at the the state level, the county level, that we agree with, everyone was copacetic with, the bills got signed, they became laws, uh, and then you have government officials coming in and issuing exemptions left and right, uh, saying, oh, no, you don't actually have to do it that way. And that's what creates the uncertainty. If developers knew exactly what they were required to do and just did it, they could build whenever they want, wherever they, the law allows. But it's because they keep pushing these things against what the community is actually asking for it that you get into these situations. So let me take one more quick question, and then we need to wrap it down. Actually, I have a, a few, so let's... Uh, I was wondering, didn't you also agree with the laws that empower those government agencies? I mean, like, didn't we already, I mean, didn't we go through the <coughs> process of getting the agreements, getting the, the, the bills signed, getting everything passed, in order to create those agencies or, or offices that open up the I'll give you, and the flexibility? Yes. yes, so I'll give you a classic example. So, um, you guys may be familiar with Kyoya, who wants to build a hotel in Waikiki, right on the shoreline. Like, really, the, the waves are slapping at their door. And they have to get a permit. And the county says, okay, you cannot build in this special design district in these ways because we want to protect like the key in the shoreline. And, but we will issue an variance if you meet these three requirements. And the three requirements basically come down to whether you have been robbed of all use of your land because of this uh, permitting process. And what happened in the Kyoya example was, even though they have a hotel there now and they're making money off the property, the county issued an exemption, a variant, saying that you have been robbed of all economic use of your land, therefore you get this variant and you can build this gigantic surfboard-shaped hotel right on shore. And that's an example of the variances that the public agreed to being misused by government and creating uncertainty in the system uh, that then leads to sort of public outcry and litigation that holds everything up. I would say that, just very briefly, you know, I mean, an issue with the PLBC, of course, is that you're creating exemptions from that whole process to begin with, the county, and to a certain extent, the state level. And so you don't have a process which folks at any point had theoretically agreed with, except through their elected officials um, at the end of the day, which is, that's a separate debate, but... <laughs> okay, let me Amen. another question. I, I'm going to just take uh, two more questions. Yes. I want to gain a better understanding of how it really works. And um, I'm uh, for nine years a big guy in the resident. And um, when I first went to the big guy, I moved to Cutler. And one of the very first places I went to when I moved to Cutler was co op. And so I have an emotional attachment to that place. And you said that um, the PLPC is going to have our own, you know, we're going to develop parks, right? But to co op residents, I, I 
specifically to that case, I think your concern is reflecting, I think, a lot of the public concern out there generally, which is what about, how does this affect my backyard and, and the things that we hold here? Um, I, I can't speak specifically to the Archaeological Survey of 6E, I think, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah I, I can't don't recall, actually. There were there were four or five bills that exempt, create exemptions from that process on the grounds that there's a federal, uh, less stringent federal process that, that um, theoretically duplicates that. I can't remember from the PLDC up top of my head that was one of those. That no, I, I, think, I think it was. Because, um, I can't remember. The yeah. Attorney General issued a sort of a explanation and said the PLDC would have to do an EIS, but mm -hmm. defense would have to get any permitting. I can't remember if you can see that. So, um, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, the situation, but, um, but what you're feeling is, I think, what everyone all around the table is feeling. But this is a feeling like, what? What's going on? And you know, local residents are feeling like the same sort of what? What's going on? You can do what? And I think I actually am not as trusting as Representative Lee and think that yeah, they sure will develop parks if they could. Yeah. Those are the best places to build for right? making our gatekeeper, money. Our gatekeeper, he's been there for years. Uncle Abel, his home was destroyed and he's been kicked off the land and I mean, if it's an archaeological survey, what purpose is kicking him in off the land and tearing his home down and mm -hmm. like what what purpose does that serve? Driving in gigantic trucks? If, if it's about protecting the land, if it's about certainly driving trucks the size of those trucks that are down those rocky roads, that's not been done before. Like it's hard to understand how this is going to benefit a community that wasn't asked before. It doesn't need Aren't you desperate for jobs? Are you desperate for workforce housing? Aren't you desperate? <laughs> Let, let's go to one last question, and then uh, certainly I, I think people will be around to talk about this after. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Representative Lee, I, I worked in the legislature in the mid-90s for three sessions, so I witnessed personally the sausage being made. My condolences. I've also been a huge construction worker though not here because I didn't agree with a lot of the development. So I understand that angle myself. And I've been trying to visualize, and you folks have addressed it a little bit about what type of projects are being proposed and what they're trying to circumvent. But the thing that bothers me a little bit, Mr. Murakami, is when you said, are we just about preserving ag lands or are we just and the flip side of that is, are we going to have development for just development's sake? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a conversation that's been going on for four decades that I've been mm here -hmm. in this state about what is the nature of development in the state? What kind of Hawaii do we want? Are we intent on making Hawaii LA in the Pacific or Hong Kong in the Pacific? Or are we going to try to preserve what we had originally before this inexorable tide, you know, began five decades ago? And then this is the question of highest and best use as it has evolved over the years. Well, I don't think that should be the standard, should it? Because then we well, pave over house. We pave over from sea to shining sea. Where <coughs> my house used to be, uh, you know, a, a very sacred <coughs> wetland that was used. Kind of like, and Michigan State folded in. Please don't use that as an example Maybe. of how Hawaii should be, though. Oh, but again, if it's it's high high us, do we want our children to have home? You know, do you live in a house? No. That house was demilitarized, and then our, our kids can stay home, then there's less subsidized housing for, for, for people coming into Hawaii. Military lands, 25% well, of are the these, state. Are even these homes being built for people that are? Here exactly. in Hawaii, we're bringing in wealthy people from outside, from the mainland and Japan, and now we'll see Chinese coming in when they want to flee the, the, the situation that they've made there, and it will escape the environmental problems and the social problems and economic problems and environmental problems that they have there. 
when when things start coming down, then that money will flee, and we'll have well, what, a rich person well, paradise. Well, let let me have that <laughs> conversation and continue after. I I think it's probably evident that this is really emotional. Property is emotional to begin with, and I would say just from the brief time that I've been here and interactions with students, that it is heightened here. Uh, these feelings. It, it is it is uh, pretty emotional. So thank you for letting me be here. Please thank our panelists.